So let me first uh, welcome you. My name is Diane Kamianka. I'm the executive director of the Northwest Innovation Resource Center. And this is another of our uh, NWIRC speaker series that focuses on technologies that are important for our innovators to have knowledge of as they move forward and work in this really competitive environment. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the NWIRC, we are a nonprofit organization that builds innovation capacity within Northwest Washington. We assist entrepreneurs in developing their individual business strategies and its execution as they move from idea to success so that they can add to the economic resilience of our region. Uh, the technologies that we now have available to us are providing some really exciting new opportunities for entrepreneurs. Uh, the one that's been pretty intriguing to many of us and is getting a lot of recent um, additional publicity is cryptocurrency. And uh, we're very pleased today to have RU with us, who's uh, an expert in this field and um, has been gracious enough to help us become totally familiar and understand what cryptocurrency is in the next hour, right? So uh, we have you all muted and uh, with the videos off so that um, we can minimize any kind of background noise and impact on the, on the presentation. Uh, feel free to add all of your questions in the chat. Ari has graciously agreed to hang around and answer as many questions as we can. Uh, also, I should note that we are recording this um, session, so it will be available for you to go back and, and review and see if there's anything that you missed or, or hearing it a second time helps the understanding of cryptocurrency because it's it's been a challenge for many of us to get our arms around really what it is. Um, so I, I believe that Ari has uh, some of her background available to put on the screen for you. So rather than sharing that now, I will introduce you to Ari and let her put that up and then take, um, take over from here and talk about cryptocurrency. So thank you, Ari, again for your time and being willing to be here and talk with us. Of course, thank you so much for having me and you're very welcome. All right, so I'll share my screen. All right, thank you for having me. Um, I uh, prepared a little presentation for you. It's actually um, smashing as many <laughs> high level topics into a half hour as possible. Uh, usually I teach this full time. And so just the topic of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin is alone is a, a four week full time course um, to get all the different uh, nuances, but uh, what I've tried to do is kind of wrap in the uh, most important priority information so that you can build a mental model and a framework um, as you, you know, go on the journey of discovering blockchain and different cryptocurrencies and this whole new ecosystem. One of the reasons blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies is really challenging for a lot of people to wrap their head around is because it's fundamentally a protocol and a network and a and a monetary system. It's like a whole um, backend infrastructure technology with the whole economic engine built into it. And so it's just a lot of different um, modes that you have to kind of figure out before you know you have the light bulb moment. You go like, oh, this totally makes sense. Um, so here we go. So here's my background. Um, I've been in this space for about six, seven years, but you know, prior to this, I was in the world of IT management consulting mostly in the world of strategy, but I did spend a lot of time in business and intelligence solutions for the uh, you know, Fortune 500 up and down the West Coast. Um, since then, um, I've been working in startups. And so I spent you know, my time fundraising in San Francisco. I actually fundraised my first seed round, eight months pregnant, first round of $640,000. So it's very possible as a woman. Um, and uh, now I work on the investing side. So working with um, a venture firm and uh, I also syndicate different deals as well. Um, my introduction to the world of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies actually began with my husband back in 2014 and 15, where he just became completely obsessed with it. And of course, you know, I had to be a very supportive wife, but um, I actually went into it mostly around 2016, 
um, where we made an angel investment into a crypto company. And then I went in as their Sheryl Sandberg to help them uh, do their ICO initial coin offering. We created our own cryptocurrency out of thin air and uh, uh, raised $32 million from a global audience within a matter of months. And then, um, you know, set up the company and off we went. Uh, today, I lead the uh, Blockchain Council, and so a lot of the work that I do today is in the regulatory and policy front, educating, educating our policymakers, investors, and also innovators in the space. And I'm uh, just finishing off a full-time bootcamp, so I've been teaching full-time um, a blockchain developer bootcamp. We're in our last week right now doing a capstone project, so a lot of, lot of work in the blockchain space, and then, you know, other stuff about me happily married and mom of two very young, beautiful boys. So you're not here to talk about me or learn about me necessarily, but um, you know, you wanna learn about cryptocurrencies and for anyone that wants to learn about cryptocurrencies or blockchain, I always say, start with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the most mature, it's the most hardened, it's the most um, long living, the mo it's the king of cryptocurrencies and it's the king of blockchains. Um, when people talk about, or the media talks about the definitions of the ideal cryptocurrency or blockchain, they're almost always 99% of the time describing Bitcoin. Um, but when you talk about other blockchains or other cryptocurrencies, they're totally not the same. I mean, Bitcoin is the line, the king of this in terms of cryptocurrencies and also blockchain. Um, everything else is just new and experimental with a lot of potential sometimes. <laughs> But um, I think the best way to begin learning and wrapping your head around the space is to start with Bitcoin and build out the mental model. And then as you learn about Ethereum or Stellar or Cardano or you know, all these different uh, protocols and cryptocurrencies, you'll have um, a way to bucketize this information. Otherwise, uh, very often people will just drown in the, uh, the knowledge soup. So starting with Bitcoin, um, you know, the price action has been very, very exciting, especially over the past 12 months and beyond. It is the best performing asset class of the decade and also of this year. So, um, you know, I've listed a bunch of, you know, uh, stats there for you. I mean, even in the first quarter of this year, it was up 94.5%. Uh, right now, the price of Bitcoin is at about $56,000. And price expectations for the rest of this year, you know, on the low end was 50, and we've already crossed that, right? So now we're looking at two, three hundred thousand um, dollars as the uh, other end of the range for the rest of this year, and who knows where it will end up. And a lot of you will go, well, how can you? I can't. I couldn't even imagine Bitcoin at fifty thousand dollars, let alone a hundred or three hundred thousand dollars. Like, why? And so that's what I'll talk about today. And in that, you'll learn about a lot of the fundamentals behind this cryptocurrency and all the uh, fundamentals behind the network and the protocol, kind of all wrapped in one. Uh, without having to learn about mining or nodes or, you know, um, ASICs, you just you, understanding these fundamentals will really help you wrap your head around the space. Um, also, I know, I think a lot of you are business owners and work in business. And so when you just look at the business case for Bitcoin, um, just looking at it with an investor hat, um, interest rates are basically at zero or negative across the world. Um, for me to get um, the yield that I need um, and make my capital work for me, um, there aren't that many great assets these days. I mean, even if you look at savings accounts, you look at conventional treasuries, you look at um, you know, stocks, S&P, NASDAQ, gold, uh, none of these uh, different assets are actually um, beating Bitcoin. I mean, even I think if you look at um, home prices, I think the rate is at a 15% year over year, especially recently, and that's still not beating Bitcoin. And so um, uh, the idea of capital management is also a, a big trend that's happened, especially over the last, say, five years, and more importantly, especially over the last year. Uh, this was a really great chart that I captured um, recently by uh, Char Charlie Bello, Bellalo um, on March 13th, but it really breaks it down by all the different asset classes year over year. And it, can sh it shows you um, just how well Bitcoin has performed against all these different assets. Um, and so I, this is another reason why there's so many people involved and interested in this asset class. This year it hit a trillion dollars in market cap. And so it became an institutional grade asset. Um, now we have many, many hedge funds and institutional funds and 
um, you know, companies, uh, public traded companies putting their treasuries into Bitcoin, as you may have seen in the news. So as I talk about the, uh, the fundamentals of Bitcoin, I'm gonna to talk to, to you about my personal experience and hopefully in talking about my personal experience with this space, it'll help you, you know, help you as you go through your own personal experience. Um, I started in the world of Ethereum and cryptocurrencies and minting my own um, basically altcoin. And uh, you know, over the last five years, I've traveled and understood Bitcoin much more. And I had my baby two years ago. And you know, after that, I took a little bit of time off and I literally had a lot of time to just read and listen to podcasts and watch videos and do that for 12, 15 hours a day. And so most people don't have that much time to just sit and learn and read, you know, 800 page books on the Federal Reserve. And this is the quote that kind of captures my experience over the last two years and putting all these different things together where I've gone, huh, we've, we've totally gotten it wrong. Um, and so confusion has been a state of mind, more or less. We're trained to be confused, quite simply. The power, people in power are keeping us down, keeping us docile, keeping us consuming with confusion. It is a cultural confusion and it is deliberate. Sounds a little bit, you know, um, uh, conspiracy theory-like perhaps, uh, but it really is the state of uh, affairs when it comes to people, not just here in the United States, but globally. You know, most of us don't think about what is money. We don't really think about our economic systems. Most of us are not financially um, educated um, into like how this all works in terms of the system. And so that's what I'll be uh, sharing with you. So the big problem that Bitcoin was created to solve in, on October 31st, 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto released the Bitcoin white paper and it was a direct response to the monetary and fiscal irresponsibility of our various governments. And so, um, you know, um, four key points on that are in 1971, the United States went off the gold standard and officially became this thing called fiat money. And so, in the world of cryptocurrencies, especially in the space, uh, you'll hear the word fiat money a lot. So it's a term that you should be familiar with if you're in the space. Um, and it means that you're dealing with money. The US dollar is government backed. It's not backed by gold. It's not backed by silver. It's backed by the you know the United States of America. And most countries around the world are is on the fiat money system. Um, the gold US dollar is also the uh, world's reserve currency. And so everything that happens with the US dollar and the US economy does affect the world very significantly. Um, the other uh, point that, um, in the Bitcoin um, white paper that it was responding to was um, the idea of quantitative easing and this um, unlimited supply of money. So especially with this pandemic, you know, we've printed literally over 40% of the entire supply of the US dollar in the past one year, past 12 months. And so you think about the whole history of the United States dollar and to think that over 40% of it has been printed very recently um, is kind of mind blowing. Like, what does that mean? I mean, it's gotta have some impact and we're seeing that impact um, already in uh, food prices and housing prices, um, in the disparity between the haves and the have nots, the, the K-shaped uh, economic recovery that you hear about in the media. Point number three is uh, central bankers um, manipulate and control the economy. So they deal with the interest rates, they deal with you know, the supply of the money in the marketplace. And um, it's, a, it's a big responsibility when you think about it. Like money is a product or a service that we all use every day and it touches every part of our lives. Um, and we have human beings that are controlling and deciding what is happening to that monetary supply. Um, and what's happening to those interest rates. And, you know, when you, you know, I read the, uh, the giant 800 page book on the Federal Reserve and my, my takeaway was, you know, a lot of these people that lead these aren't actually experts on money. I mean, they all have theories um, and their theories are driving a lot of what's happening to our economy. And there's, there's some really, really big impacts that most of us don't realize are happening. And then this uh, term called inflation, a lot of people are talking about inflation. The government says the inflation rate in 2021 is supposed to be at 2.5%. Um, generally, you know, most people assume that an inflation rate of two to 3% is good. You know, policymakers also think it's great. 
Uh, but when you take a step back and you look at how is this actually calculated, you look at this term called the CPI, the consumer price index, it actually doesn't quite make sense, right? Because it's a very general, broad definition and calculation. And um, I would bet that my household of goods and services that we buy is not the same as Diane's or, you know, John's or Joe's or whomever's. Um, we all have different uh, household goods and services that we buy. You know, some of us um, just want to have a nice, you know, home and send our kids to college. Uh, some of us aspire to, you know, nicer things like homes in the Hamptons and, you know, big extravagant luxuries. Like our, the inflation rate is different for every single person and every single family. And having one general inflation rate doesn't necessarily really make sense. Um, and as I mentioned before, the topic of what is money is really the thing that's being questioned right now. So like, you know, when you think about like, what is Bitcoin? Wait a minute, what is cryptocurrencies? Oh, what's the CBDC thing that people are talking about? What we're asking really is like, what is money? And so, you know, that's the fundamental question that we're gonna be talking about. You know, like, how does this dollar work? How does the Bitcoin work? Um, what is good money? Um, these are things that we should all, you know, take a step back and learn. Uh, so a quick history lesson. As I mentioned before, the in 1971, the US went off the gold standard. Actually, President Nixon, when he uh, let the people, American people know this, he said, this is gonna be a temporary experiment. We just need to take care of this uh, debt issue that we got going on here. Is, um, yeah, and so this temporary experiment has gone on 50 years and um, has had some great uh, grave impacts on the world um, and also in the United States. There's actually a great website um, called WTF, happened in 1971.com. Uh, I would recommend checking it out because it literally is chart after chart after chart after chart after chart, like hundreds of charts of what the impact of, if you just look at um, the impact on, you know, home prices and, you know, uh, income levels and, you know, women versus men's um, uh, income. And it just has all these different charts that describe what has happened um, in relation to the, the US going off the gold standard and becoming fiat money in 1971. And the problem with fiat money, and we've learned this um, over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of human history is that anything that does not have um, a hard backed um, monetary fundamental backing it, fiat money um, never goes well. This is a picture of like the Weimar Republic uh, where, you know, they went into hyperinflation mode, um, you know, shortly after World War I because of, you know, the Treaty of Versailles and all the reparations that the government had to pay. Um, you may have heard this in the media, the idea of quantitative easing. And so um, there's just a lot of printing going on globally, not just in the United States. And so um, if you're following the world of cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin, this is a big criticism of fiat money and governments globally. Um, and, you know, like with over 40% of the U.S. dollar supply printed in the last 12 months, uh, that should say to you, like, what is the actual supply of money? right? Like if I have $10 over $100, I have 10%, right? But if my $10 is now over $1,000, that's that's not 10% anymore. Like, what is that? I, I, I can't even do the math right now, 1%. So uh, that that is what's happening. The denominator of, you know, whatever your, your wealth is um, over the you know, total supply of money has increased significantly. And this is a, um, an issue that's happening globally. And, uh, you know, the, we went off the gold standard in 1971 and we've been printing money um, ever since. And uh, this has had a tr truly like big impact um, on everything that touches our lives, you know, our productivity, our compensation, our, the prices, um, you know, um, yeah. And here, this is sort of the, uh, the synopsis of this, you know, all of this printing, money printing, yes, the supply is getting bigger. And so you have to wrap your head around like, you know, the looking at fractions, right? Like this is my wealth and the, the bottom, the denominator is growing exponentially. Um, and then there's also this word called the uh, Cantillon effect. And it means that those that are closest to the money printing 
uh, will receive the value of that newly printed money first. And by the time that money reaches those, um, the, the rest of the people, it's basically lost its value and become worthless. And so what this means is 49% uh, of Americans have an asset, an asset meaning like real estate or stock, 401k, IRA. Um, and so when money printing happens, a lot of that value ends up in home prices. It ends up in the stock market. And so we've seen that, right? The stock market is up, you know, like crazy. You look at Tesla stock, Apple stock, Amazon stock, just you, you name it. Um, stocks are just great. And, you know, everyone's become a retail investor, you know, Robinhood, um, their signups have just been off the charts. Um, and it's because, um, you know, people see like these prices going up, but it's because this money printing ends up in those, um, in, in the, these assets or, you know, home prices are up 15% um, right now. And so, you know, a lot of people are selling and cashing in on this, um, but it's not really, it's not really helping everybody. It's only helping the top 49% of Americans. The other 51% of Americans don't get to take benefit of these increased asset prices and these increased uh, wealth building opportunities. They're, they're really, really hurting. So to really understand Bitcoin, you know, the backdrop of what's going on with the macroeconomics and the money and like uh, is really important to know. And then you layer in like the Bitcoin fundamentals. And here we'll touch upon like the cryptocurrency fundamentals and also the uh, the network protocol fundamentals in in um, in a quick eight minutes or so. So Bitcoin fundamentals. One of the most important things about Bitcoin is that it's a hard capped. 21 million Bitcoins will ever, 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 ever exist. And so it is the hardest institutional grade, scarcest asset on earth. There's nothing more scarce than Bitcoin. And you know, this is one of the things as people discover and understand Bitcoin, you realize this and you go, there's, there's nothing that's actually better. Um, and it's also the most secure asset in the, in the world. So um, a lot of folks will also say like it's inflationary or disinflationary or de deflationary. It's actually disinflationary. So there's a smaller and smaller amount of new Bitcoins being created and released into the market over time. And so by the year 2140, that 21 million Bitcoins um, hard cap is, will be reached and then the rate of change is going to be zero. So the hard cap is really, really important, especially when it comes to like fiat money versus hard money and Bitcoin is considered hard money. So I just mentioned this rate of change. Gold has traditionally been very valuable because the rate of change is, you know, known to be 1.5 percent. And you can imagine, like, big, uh, uh, gold is really hard to mine. Like you have to get these giant machines, and you got to go dig up the rocks and like find it and melt it, and um, it's really heavy. So um, that rate of change is known and also predictable and uh, very, very low, which makes um, that gold as an asset valuable. Bitcoin's uh, rate of change is um, even more hard-coded. It's even slower and it, at the end by 2140, it's zero. And so, um, and that doesn't change. Uh, one of the things that's really important to realize is like, what if big, um, gold right now is at about $1,700, $1,800, um, right? So what if gold suddenly went up um, 100X and it was $100,000? then everybody, their, your mom, everyone would be digging through and like finding gold, melting it down. And like suddenly you'd see this crazy increase of supply in the marketplace of gold. Uh, with Bitcoin, even with the price of Bitcoin going up to $56,000 today or you know $100,000 maybe later this year or next year, um, Bitcoin's rate of change will never, will, is hard coded into the protocol. And so it'll never change. Durable, gold is durable. So, you know, gold is the same as it was in 2000, the year 2000, as it was in the year 1900. Bitcoin is also the same in terms of I, the idea. People will say like, oh, it's not that durable because what if the entire world loses its internet uh, connection and we no longer have power? Well, I think if that happens, we'll have different problems, but uh, the likelihood is very low. Bitcoin fundamentals, uh, fungibility and divisibility. So the idea that um, I can throw on, onto a table, you know, 10 gold coins and pick up any gold coin, um, it's fungible. Or like if I throw on a table, a hundred um, $1 bills, I can pick up any one of these $1 bills and they're all equal to $1. 
Same thing with Bitcoin. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin equals Bitcoin. And Bitcoin can also be divided into Satoshis. And so just like you have 100 pennies in every $1, you have 100 million Satoshis in every one Bitcoin. And I think this is an important um, fact to know because a lot of folks will say like, oh, Bitcoin's so expensive, I can't afford it. Well, no, you can, you can buy $10 of Bitcoin, you can buy a dollar of Bitcoin, you can buy $1,000 of Bitcoin. So there's um, Satoshis. So if Bitcoin's price is $56,000, to figure out the number of Satoshis in one US dollar, you take $1 and you divide it by, um, because there are 100 million Satoshis in every um, one Bitcoin, it's out to the 100 million places. And so you divide it by 0 0.00, 0.00, that's eight decimal places out, and you get 1785 Satoshis for every $1. It's a lot of math and it's a lot of, um, it's a little weird to wrap your head around, especially in the beginning when you're first getting into cryptocurrencies, but um, once you get used to it, um, it starts to make sense. And so for those that struggle with arithmetic like myself, you know, Bitcoin's price is $56,000. You go out eight decimal places out and you throw the uh, price at the end. And that's how you figure out Satoshis for every $1. Sensorability is also a reason why uh, Bitcoin is um, very important. So, you know, gold is very heavy. Um, paper money is government owned. Um, and both of these things are um, controlled and managed by um, whoever um, is in power. And so like, you know, gold at one point in our history was, um, you know, confiscated by the government. Paper money and our financial systems, um, those who do not fit um, the, the definitions of what makes a good player in the ecosystem are kind of kept out of the uh, financial ecosystem. The great thing about Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. So there's no CEO, there's no company that owns it. There's, it's, it's thousands and thousands of miners and nodes that, um, that uh, secure the network. And so in a good example of this story is uh, there's a famous NFL football player named Russell Okung, um, big, big hefty guy. And uh, he, he's, you know, I heard him say this quote, he said, I put my life on the line, my body on the line so that I can earn wealth. And when I go on vacation, I expect to have access to my wealth. And so his story is he went to his home country of Nigeria and he went to the bank to pull out his money and the bank said, no. And he was like, what? You know, like it's my money. And the bank said, no, 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 we don't do business with Nigeria. And so no, you can't have your money. And so after that, he got really upset and uh, he uh, has been a very, very uh, strong Bitcoin advocate since then, especially uh, in the last uh, six months, he actually has, um, you know, I think you might have seen it in the media. He gets paid now half his salary in Bitcoin and that's, you, you know, using uh, the Lightning Network and this uh, application called Strike. Uh, but he's a big, big uh, believer in this because of that horrible experience that he had when he went to Nigeria. Portability, uh, gold is very physically heavy to carry, so paper money run out in terms of portability. Bitcoin is digitally native, and so it is the easiest to carry out of you know, these three. Verifiable, so gold is physical, paper money is physical, but when you really think about it, do we know how much total supply of US dollars there really is? And do we know how much that total supply of US dollars will be at the end of this year in December of 2021? let alone next year in 2022, uh, we don't. Um, the great thing about Bitcoin is that everything is on a transparent ledger. You can see, you know, um, you can see, you know, where the total supply, you can see the total um, rate of change. You can see which wallets have, you know, what amounts and, you know, the movement of um, assets. Um, the also great thing about Bitcoin is you have final settlement within minutes. Um, and that's something that you don't have with today's financial systems. You know, like I want to send a wire transfer and I, I do that a lot right now because um, I am syndicating for a fund and, you know, my investors are sending in um, wiring and money and, you know, the Sunday down a Friday and sometimes it'll show up on a Tuesday or Wednesday, you know, sometimes the wire transfer won't happen. Uh, lots of, lots of issues. And, you know, the great thing about Bitcoin is I can see the, the transaction confirmed and I can see it within minutes and I can do it at any time. I don't have to work banking hours. It's 24 seven. I can send it at a 10 PM on a Saturday night to, you know, my, my family member in Korea. So that when you experience your first uh, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin transaction, 
um, you know, the first series of light bulbs will go off where you see like the real power um, of this technology. So the great traits of money um, we've learned over human history, you know, from seashells to rye rocks to agribeads to, you know, all these different varieties of money. And what we've learned is that like the best traits of money um, are that it's verifiable, it's fungible, it's portable, it's durable, it's divisible, it's scarce. Um, it's you know, ideally censorship resistant. Um, and across all of these different characteristics, Bitcoin is literally um, probably one of the strongest when you compare it against gold or our, our current monetary system of fiat dollars. Um, the only part where like maybe Bitcoin and it, obviously, you know, the established history is shorter, but that's where I say, you know, 10 years ago, did we imagine that Uber and Airbnb would be a thing, you know? Uh, 10 years ago in my car, I had you know, stacks and stacks of printout MapQuest papers to get around anywhere because I'm you know, spatially challenged. Um, but today, now I can just use my phone and throw up Google Maps and you know, I have turn by turn directions. I would have never imagined that 10 years ago. And so when you think of the idea that software is eating the world and technology is changing the face of how we live and work and communicate. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you via Zoom right now. Um, you know, that might you know, help ease any concerns around the low established history of Bitcoin. You know, a lot of, you're here to learn about different cryptocurrencies and I'm, I'm um, I guess advocating that you learn about Bitcoin first as a cryptocurrency and as a, as a uh, protocol. Um, Cause like there's nothing like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the king and the most mature and the, the most secure technology of all. Um, all other cryptocurrencies do not stack up against Bitcoin. So yes, they might be verifiable, but depending on how the code was written of you know, said cryptocurrency, eh, they're fungible, yes, generally, unless you're talking about you know, uh, non-fungible tokens, which are not really cryptocurrencies. Yes, they're very portable because they're digital. They're durable, as durable as Bitcoin is. They're divisible generally, you know, but are they scarce? No, no. Um, a lot of these uh, cryptocurrencies have unlimited supply. Like even if you look at number two, Ethereum has an unlimited supply. There is no hard cap supply. Um, you know, established history. Bitcoin is at you know twelve years. Every other cryptocurrency, Ethereum, which is you know number two on, in terms of uh, market cap, its established history is you know five six years at best, right? Um, I would argue like. Ethereum's established history now is at zero because they're rewriting their entire protocol. They're moving all of their um, consensus mechanisms. Everything's being rewritten. And so, yeah, I don't know. And then you look at a lot of the uh, DeFi protocols and these different cryptocurrencies. They're, you know, one, two, three years old. <sighs> not, not as um, established history, censorship resistant. Well, actually, most other cryptocurrencies, I'd argue even Ethereum is centralized. And so, um, no, they're not censorship resistant. Bitcoin is the only one that is censorship resistant because it is the only cryptocurrency that is truly decentralized. Um, unforgeable costliness. You know, Bitcoin is on proof of work. Um, there's just nothing like it. Openly programmable, decentralized. Again, I, I mentioned that before. So a quick run through of all the arguments against Bitcoin. Um, so like it has no intrinsic value because it has no central authority. Uh, the counter argument to that is, well, what gives something value? The market gives something value. The market has said Bitcoin is now $56,000 a, a coin. Um, I know, do you believe in the market or do you not believe in the market? Your, your decision, you know, Bitcoin is so volatile well, I'd say the word volatile is very uh, negative. When I think of something volatile, I think of you know college prices. You know, college prices are volatile because they just go up astronomically every year. Or you know, um, yeah, that's that's volatile. But when you look at Bitcoin, you know it it's been volatile, obviously, but also you know it's risen in price and is the best performing asset year over year. Bitcoin doesn't scale well. Um, a lot of people will argue, you know, it doesn't scale. And so, you know, um, you know, something is gonna kill it. Mm, I'd say it does scale because there are Satoshis, you know, there's a hundred million Satoshis for every one Bitcoin. And so, you know, one Satoshi is worth, you know, 0. 0.00001 cent today, but, you know, eventually the Satoshis will be worth one, 
one cent to what it is today in US dollars. Um, uh, technology is constantly evolving and updating and the network is continuing to grow. And so, you know, I think Bitcoin does scale. Uh, Bitcoin miners will quit. And so, you know, um, I told you in 2140, the uh, rewards will get to zero and um, the miners that secure Bitcoin's network will um, only earn through transaction fees. And so, you know, my, my counter argument to that is, yeah, the, you know, big giant conglomerate mining pools may quit because, you know, it's no longer as lucrative as it is today, but, you know, mom, there'll be more decentralization. So you'll have more individual miners that'll continue and earn some um, transaction fees because, you know, it's worth it for them. It's just not worth it for the giant corporations in these mining pools. Uh, Bitcoin is deflationary and that's bad. So um, it's actually disinflationary. So remember the rate of change of Bitcoin is um, decreasing over time until it's zero in 2140. And the supply is hard cap. So 21 million Bitcoin will ever be created, and never ever anything more. So uh, one of, that's one of the strongest points on why Bitcoin. Another, uh, another counter argument is that, you know, a bug could destroy Bitcoin. Well, yes, perhaps, but uh, the code is open source and there are thousands and thousands of nodes and miners and the infrastructure is um, just so decentralized that there's a lot of folks that are constantly updating and uh, watching out for the Bitcoin's network. And also remember Bitcoin has never been hacked or um, it's also the most secure, um, you know, different exchanges, centralized exchanges or, you know, human led applications uh, using Bitcoin have been hacked, but Bitcoin itself has never been hacked. Another argument that people say in the media will say very often is that Bitcoin wastes energy. Um, yes, Bitcoin uses a lot of energy, but when you think about it with money, something that touches every part of our lives and every one of us, wouldn't you want to use energy to secure that network? And then you know, you look at the current monetary system today, that uses a lot of energy. You know, the, the armored trucks with, you know, driving around the bank tellers, the ATMs, the, the buildings, all the different applications. And then Bitcoin is only used by terrorists. Well, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin has been used by terrorists, but you know, the US dollar is also used by terrorists. And so um, it's not really like a strong argument against Bitcoin because you know, PayPal was used by terrorists and money laundering originally too. So, uh, yeah. So the general gist of this talk is fiat money is no bueno. Um, it's never ended well. We see this with the Turkey today. We've seen it with Venezuela. We've seen it with Zimbabwe. You know, you can actually buy $1 billion uh, paper notes on eBay um, because their inflation got so bad. And we're, we're on that track right now here in the US. Uh, I mentioned this uh, this point, the Cantillon effect. You know, if you have the ability to print, um, you're going to print. And you know, we've seen the Federal Reserve, we've seen the uh, ECB, we've seen the Jap Japanese uh, central bank try and do the right thing, but it's really, really difficult when you're in those positions. Um, they're going to continue to print because they need to keep the people happy, uh, maintain social, you know, peace. Um, and you know, inflation rates will continue to stay low. Um, and so, I would I would suggest you know always do your own research. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, stuff packed into here. You know, history, macroeconomics. You know, look at Austrian economics versus Keynesian economics. Look, read about the Federal Reserve and the central banking system. Uh, read about World War One and you know the Treaty of Versailles. Read about you know the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, World War II. Uh, there's so much in there to uh, read and uh, digest um, to really wrap around what's going on. Um, you know, if you want to get into Bitcoin, I always say dollar cost average. Don't try to time the market, um, or you know, any cryptocurrency. Don't try to time the market. Do your own research. I recommend Swan Bitcoin because it literally has the best fees in terms of the spread. Uh, Coinbase for the consumer, they actually do charge quite a bit, especially if you're buying $10, $100, $1,000. Um, or you can use Coinbase Pro, but the interface is a little bit more complicated. So Swan Bitcoin, they also have really great um, educational resources. If you'd like to learn more about this, um, you know, 
read the Bitcoin standard or you could read the uh, online essays by um, Parker Lewis, Gradually Then Suddenly. Um, I'm always available. Don't feel shy about emailing me, finding me on Twitter, texting me, whatever means you need. Um, I'm here to answer questions um, or point you to resources. And then on other cryptocurrencies, I didn't spend that much time on it because there are so many other cryptocurrencies out there. There are over 6,500 different cryptocurrencies. If you go to coinmarketcap.com or coingecko.com, um, I've had a lot of folks that say to me like, oh my God, I just bought XYZ or XRP or blah, blah, blah. And, I go, and they're like, it was so much cheaper than Bitcoin. I go, no, no, it's not cheaper. You're buying a completely different product. You're buying something that, you know, Bitcoin, you're buying a hardened, mature, secure, institutional grade asset, or you're buying Ripple, a very centralized, questionable, <laughs> not investment advice, but it's the fundamentals are completely not in the same ballpark. Um, you know, with cryptocurrencies, you can make 6,000% yield in a month or in a matter of days. Um, there's actually a cryptocurrency out now in the last three weeks, it went up 60,000%. Um, so like, these things can happen in the world of cryptocurrencies, but that cryptocurrency that I just mentioned, it's only been around for a couple of months. It's brand new. You don't, we, we know nothing about it. And so when you're dealing with a lot of the other cryptocurrencies outside of Bitcoin, it really is gambling in lots of ways. If you're going to be working in the world of cryptocurrencies, you wanna make sure you do your own research, understand the fundamentals. And I, I, I really um, am a strong believer that if you understand Bitcoin, the blockchain and the cryptocurrency, you can kind of build off um, your knowledge and awareness of other cryptocurrencies and blockchains from there. Um, always look at it very, very, very critically. Uh, read the founders' stories and do research very, join the communities, join the Telegram groups, the Discord groups, the, the email groups, the Slack groups, ask questions. Um, there's a lot of vaporware out there. And so, um, just be very, very careful when it comes to cryptocurrencies. Um, talk to another person, you know, feel free to reach out to me and be like, hey, I'm interested in buying this. And I can say like, I know them or I don't know them or point you to someone that is dealing with them. Um, I think that's the best way to deal with it. But ultimately most of these other cryptocurrencies are not decentralized at all. So like, that's like one big fundamental. You know, most of them do not have a hard cap supply. Most of them, um, you know, have a pre-mine, meaning like, you know, if they minted a hundred dollars worth of a new cryptocurrency, they've kept like 50% of it for themselves, the employees, the investors, the advisors, and, you know, maybe another 30% of the supplies in the market today, but we don't know where the other 20% is going to come from and when it's going to come out. And we don't know when the employees, the advisors, and investors are going to be releasing their shares. Um, so it's a, it's a very opaque game. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to be dealing with other cryptocurrencies, you're going to be looking for asymmetric information. You're going to be looking for insider information um, with somebody that has an inside uh, track into that particular company. Um, and that's one of the best ways to uh, win in this cryptocurrency world. You know, in relation to other cryptocurrencies and um, other technologies that are around this, you know, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies are often mentioned. Um, they're you know, if you look at follow the IMF and the G20, a lot of them have been exploring CBDCs. The United States have been looking at CBDCs. You've seen maybe recent news in the past few days with Facebook's DM being, you know, potential CBDC um, infrastructure. Um, these are not cryptocurrencies. These are basically taking your fiat money and digitizing it. That's it. And if you look at the US dollar, it's already 90% digitized. And so now it's going to 100% digitized. And now like every transaction that happens in, in that particular fiat currency can now be tracked. Um, who it goes to, what's it being spent on, how much, you know, um, taxes can be automated, literally like your paycheck comes in and automatically goes to the government, boom, ta-da. Um, but you also have, you know, issues like censorship and, you know, access, you know, being unknown um, and being very centrally controlled as well too. Uh, edge computing decentralization is going to be a, a theme. And so, you know, you'll see a lot more um, conversations around, you know, um, decentralizing these uh, pots of, you know, information or pots of um, compute power. Um, and that'll be a continued theme as we look over, you know, the next five to 10 years. Um, other, you know, external te emerging technologies like machine learning, artificial intelligence, AR, VR, XR, they all need blockchain um, underlying it uh, to, you know, 
manage the the trust question because you know like if I come on to a zoom meeting if you've never met me if you've never seen me um, how do you know that I'm really airy you <laughs> right um, these are things that we may need to you know figure out as we uh, start using a lot more of these emerging technologies all right I might have gone a little bit over but you know, feel free to tweet, um, email me, contact me anytime with any questions. I'm happy to answer them anytime. And that's it. So I know there's a couple questions in the chat now and, and um, any of you that are on the call, please feel free to put them in. Or if, uh, if it's a long question and you'd like to just um, unmute, and ask the question, feel free to do that. That might be a little bit easier as well. So I did, have you seen the, uh, the questions, Ari, that are in the chat? Yeah, so I see one from Amy McCabe. How does the US government tax Bitcoin activities? How does the Bitcoin owner reflect Bitcoin in their returns? Uh, so uh, Bitcoin is taxed typically when it's sold. Um, and so we treat it like capital gains. And so um, generally when uh, dealing with cryptocurrencies, we, uh, we note by wallet address uh, or with account number, the, the date and time and price I acquire the Bitcoin. And then if I ever decide to sell it, then I would have you know, a positive or minus and you know, taxes would come from there. Um, so yeah, treat it like a capital gains tax. Generally, you know, if you're a believer in the Bitcoin space, you're going to be looking at Bitcoin as a different kind of asset. And so ideally you would actually not be selling, you would be treating it like a house, right? So, you know, you build wealth through houses or, you know, you'll get, um, a lot of these, uh, traditional wealth, wealthy families that have bought blocks and blocks of, you know, New York city, for instance, and they will it, um, to their gener generations, children and children. And, you know, as the price of that asset goes up, they take loans against it and they go do whatever they need. And then the price has gone up. And so like it, um, that's that's the way a lot of folks are actually seeing Bitcoin. Um, it's more of a uh, hard asset than, you know, a, uh, a stock type of asset. If one is starting a business using crypto, what are the considerations for determining which one to utilize? So um, it really depends. I mean, if you want to, you know, be able to accept uh, cryptocurrencies like you're an e-commerce business, you know, you might want to start with Bitcoin, of course, but, you know, Ethereum, um, Litecoin, there are a bunch of others that are very popular and you can look at coingecko.com or coinmarketcap.com to see, you know, the top five-ish most popular cryptocurrencies, but that does change from time to time. So if you look at the top two, those generally don't change. Bitcoin and Ethereum are always at the top. Um, and then, um, you know, manage, manage, um, have the uh, accounting, make sure you're working with an accounting partner that knows how to work with that on the back end. Um, locally here, we have a company called Clark Nuber, and they have a, a lot of experience working with cryptocurrencies uh, for businesses and also individuals. So um, I definitely check them out. Um, if you're going to start a uh, business using cryptocurrencies as sort of a, uh, a loyalty token or, um, you know, as a funding mechanism, then um, an important thing to know is um, being very regulatory aware, um, working in cryptocurrencies, you're global first. And so you're not just launching a company here in Washington state, you're launching a company that is global. And so being aware of the regulatory frameworks, um, different jurisdictions and having the proper legal team to deal with that, you definitely have like your startup attorney you know, who's done hundreds and hundreds of startups, your corporate attorney, you'll have one that knows um, how to deal with money transmission issues and uh, FinCEN and that. And then you'll have another attorney that deals with securities. You know, is this a security or not a security and your argument against it. So um, cryptocurrency companies um, have a little bit more of an operational burden um, in getting started. Do you know of any businesses currently accepting Bitcoin as an online payment method? Do you suggest any resources for accepting payments online, specifically the technology behind it? So there are actually, if you go, um, I think you can Google it, um, companies are, um, that accept Bitcoin. And there, there's a pretty large list. I mean, you look at overstock.com, you look at microsoft.com, you look at um, 
most most companies now accept Bitcoin as a payment method. Um, so yes, there's a lot of businesses accepting Bitcoin as a payment method, especially these days. Um, just more and more have been adopting it. Uh, do you suggestions for adopting accepting payments online? Um, not off the top of my head, but if you want me to look into it, I can look into it. Um, I would say like look look at the payment processors, and so you know I would start with like Stripe or um, PayPal, right? PayPal has um, gone all in on Bitcoin, especially with the Venmo announcement yesterday. So um, yeah, check it out. Oh, Miha Miller um, says they can help with uh, cryptocurrencies, currencies, taxes uh, with their email address. So that's really great. Um, great to know, Miha. <clears throat> what is so my are view? Are there any specific attorneys that are, are knowledgeable about cryptocurrency that you would suggest in the area? Yeah, generally, I would go to a lot of the uh, bigger firms because they just have more experience working across the United States and also globally. Um, that network will be pretty important. <clears throat> I mean, locally, uh, and it depends on the kind of business, you know, are you a fund? Are you an e-commerce business? Are you a software business? And so you know, Perkins, Cooey, uh, Wilson, WSGR, um, there's some smaller ones like Gravis Law, Jill Williamson is really, really great. Um, so like depending on the situation, just you know, feel free to email me and happy to make referrals or send you some suggestions. Okay. Um, someone just asked me a question on like, what's your view on ICOs, inter in initial coin offerings? Um, initial coin offerings are sort of like the uh, IPO, you know, companies IPO go into the public realm uh, once they hit a certain large size of $100 million or so. Uh, initial coin offerings are done um, at a much earlier stage of companies, so typically pre-seed or seed stage companies where they they create create or mint a uh, cryptocurrency token to put into the marketplace. I did one of those back in 2017. I'd say they're really great as an entrepreneur. Um, if you can figure out a way to do it and do it legally um, and safely, staying as much in the white side of the gray space as possible with great, uh, great legal team, um, I think it's great for entrepreneurs to do. Uh, for investors, I'd say it's very, very uh, risky because you actually get nothing for it. You get you get access to a cryptocurrency, but the cryptocurrency is not backed by anything. It's it's backed by a newly minted startup company's promise to deliver a certain product. Yeah, there's two perspectives on it. Um, generally, here in the United States and Canada, they're they're not generally accepted anymore. So if you want to participate in an ICO, you have to be somewhere not here. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's really, really hard to do. Um, last, the last year to actually do it pretty successfully here in the United States was 2017. So, um, it's just become really hard right now. If you buy on Coinbase, it is capped at a certain amount where you can buy Bitcoin in bigger amounts. Uh, yeah, there is a little bit of a shortage going on. So, um, you know, you can check out I would start with Coinbase. So if you're going to use Coinbase, use Coinbase Pro because the fees are significantly better. Um, you can go to Swan Bitcoin, you can go to BlockFi, you can go to Celsius. Oh, but Washington State, we're blocked from Celsius. So if, you, if you're if you somewhere else, um, definitely check out Celsius. Um, there, there's uh, Bittrex, uh, there's Binance. So there's lots of different places. I would go to like a larger um, exchange to buy the bigger amounts of Bitcoin. If you're doing it for a company or a corporation, then you know, check out something like um, Gemini, which has more of the institutional grade um, services or Coinbase um, also has um, uh, an institutional uh, OTC desk. Oh, if you wanna buy Bitcoin in bigger, bigger amounts, like OTC desks are also a great way to do that. So there's a company called Circle. Um, that's a great way to do that. Um, you, you call up somebody and you wire them some money and then they send you a whole bunch of Bitcoin. Um, I have to say, I, it's still very confusing to me, Ari. I, what part is confusing? I, well, I'm just so accustomed to money, you know, where that's visible, the, the concept of uh, when somebody's going to start a whole new currency, you know, what would motivate them for doing that and their return on it and and the fact that somebody else investing in it really gets nothing out of it except participating in an experience, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so like, if you think about money in the US dollar, um, 
we sort of understand it, right? Because we use it, but I'd say most of us don't really understand what is the US dollar even. Um, and so the US dollar is already digital, right? Like you do, you know, you use PayPal and you um, you don't really write checks so much anymore, right? Like you, you uh, uh, send money to pay bills and you use credit cards to pay for things already. Um, and so we're already digital. Uh, um, the great thing about cryptocurrencies and especially Bitcoin is that it was designed to be in a natively digital environment. Um, paper money was designed to be paper money and now it's being digitized, but there's a lot of issues with um, the digital infrastructure. And so the great thing about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is that from the bottom level zero all the way up, um, every part of this infrastructure and the protocol and the network and the currency was designed to be in a digital environment. And so that's the biggest one thing I think maybe to uh, um, I think understand and appreciate, especially when it comes to Bitcoin, not so much about other cryptocurrencies. <laughs> I, I am a little bit biased there. So take it with a grain of salt and you know make your own decisions on that. Uh, several more questions. So uh, is it a good idea to invest in Bitcoin ETFs? Um, I actually really like them. Um, you know, uh, I, I've just been learning about alternative investments and that you can do like checkbook IRAs and um, these sorts of things. But, you know, with my 401k and IRA, we do have quite a bit of it in like GPTC, um, which is like a publicly available, basically ETF uh, for Bitcoin. And they also have like Ethereum and um, other cryptocurrency uh, type of products. And so I would um, check that out. Uh, so. Yeah, if you believe in this asset class and you don't necessarily want to buy it and figure out, you know, your strategy around it, you know, you know, Bitcoin ETFs or um, stuff like that was definitely a way, great, you know, great way to diversify your portfolio and get exposure to it. I would relate Bitcoin to digital gold. Yes, I agree, Miha. But better than digital gold because it's hard cap supply. Another question, is the US government or US banking system threatened by the prevalence of cryptocurrency? Yes, of course. Um, you know, one is completely centralized and owned um, and controlled by the government and one Bitcoin is not controlled and owned by any government. Um, so like, you know, a lot of them are, you know, moving towards CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, which will give them a lot of the, uh, the benefits of a Bitcoin or digital currency. Um, but with all the powers and control and centralization that the government feels that they need, there's a bit of game theory going on here with the world of Bitcoin too. So, you know, one of the things that we say is um, there are 187 countries in the world, you know, here in the United States, you know, I, you know, feel very personally blessed to, you know, have grown up here and work here and live here. And so we don't feel a lot of the uh, stresses around money like those in Venezuela or Zimbabwe or, you know, Turkey these days, right? Um, but say like, you know, you have 187 countries, let's say like the bottom 50 by GDP uh, countries decide to say like, my Turkish lira is not doing so great. Or, you know, my Venezuelan or Zimbabwe dollar is not doing so great. Let's, let's, let's throw this national currency out the window and let's peg our national currency to the Bitcoin. Um, so the idea of game theory is really, really big here because, you know, big incentives are there. You know, you look at the, uh, the not so friendly countries with the United States, like the country of Iran, the, they're investing more and more into the world of Bitcoin. If you've been watching the news or you look at China, they've officially banned it, but they've continued to be, you know, one of the bigger powerhouses behind the miners. And so the, think about the, uh, the game theory, you know, so as um, more countries peg their, national currency to Bitcoin, you know, countries will rise and it might be the great equalizer in the end. Uh, another, what could they do? Yeah, um, well, the other thing that the US government could also do is like create clear regulations around, you know, our view of this, this currency. You don't wanna block it because that actually increases um, people's rush to it. You know, India, China are two examples of countries that are, have tried to ban it. And it actually increased the adoption of Bitcoin in those said countries. Um, so what they'll need to do is make sure that they have um, good um, on ramps and off ramps between the the fiat currency like the U.S. dollar to this digital world and back, and they're 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 properly regulating it without um, squishing it too hard. 
I may have missed it, but who, what developed Bitcoin? Satoshi Nakamoto is a pseudonymous unknown person. We don't know if it's a man or a she or um, a they. Um, developed Bitcoin, released the white paper on October 31st, uh, 2008. It's an eight page white paper. I would really recommend reading it. It's very, very short, pretty um, easy to read. Um, and there's also um, a, a, a YouTube uh, video by Jill Carlson where she talks about the, the, the Satoshi Nakamoto and the history behind uh, Bitcoin. I'll share that with uh, Diane afterwards and she can send it out to everybody, but it was super, super eye-opening. Um, really, really great video. Jill Carlson, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, if you Google it, I think you might be able to find it. I also put it on my blog post. I transcribed the entire video. So if you wanna uh, check out my blog, it's there. Um, will it be a requirement for me to get Bitcoin to survive in the future, my children? Well, um, so, you know, I can't give you investment advice, but if you believe, if you look, take a step back and you look at all that's happening, you know, in terms of the macroeconomics, you look at what's happened to our currencies across the world, especially the United States since like 1911, um, and some significant um, milestones along the way that have really changed and affected where we are today. Um, I say like, yes, Bitcoin is like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get in. Um, it's, it's dire right now. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, the world reserve currency won't be the US dollar for the next five years or 10 years or another 20 years, that that time is going to be up soon. And what is that next re world reserve currency going to be? Is it going to be the Chinese one? I mean, I'm, I'm very sure the Chinese are gunning for it. I don't really want that myself, you know, to be on a Chinese one uh, global reserve currency. What else is it going to be? There aren't very many great options. Um, so I would say that um, I look at Bitcoin as an asset. So sort of like, you know, you buy homes or real estate or land um, to store your wealth. Bitcoin is similar. And so I would, you know, create trust and like, you know, try and find a way to like earn and save up one Bitcoin per child or some, you know, whatever that magic number is for yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, give them that leg up um, for their futures but not investment advice and, you know, make your own decisions, do your own research on that. Stephanie says, do you think real estate will be sold on the blockchain? If so, and when? Um, real estate, probably eventually. I mean, there's, there's so much infrastructure and stuff that needs to be figured out before we get to that. So in terms of blockchain technology adoption, we're really, 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 really early. Um, I've talked to quite a few folks in the real estate world um, and, you know, they, they're trying to figure out how to, you know, do the, the contracts tracking and, you know, the access controls using blockchain. And so that part has been figured out, but when it comes to actually selling or fractional real estate, that's still really early. Um, there are more proof of concepts right now. I think there are a couple of projects that are like making a little bit more traction, but you got to go get through the regulatory stuff. You got to get through the paperwork. You got to get through all these different parties. Um, and so we're, we're really, really early. And then Juan says, is Bitcoin working on an Ethereum protocol? Eh? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Actually, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, um, Bitcoin is Bitcoin and Ethereum is Ethereum to me. Um, Ethereum has changed quite a bit, especially as it moves to Ethereum 2.0. And so it's becoming less and less like Bitcoin. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you could buy, you can have Bitcoin as an asset on the Ethereum network, like Miha says with Wrap Bitcoin, but um, it's not like a proto, it's not, they're not, they're not married. It's, it's just a way of having this asset on the Ethereum network, just like you can have synthetics, like synthetic uh, Tesla stock or Facebook stock on the Ethereum network, um, especially in these the DeFi world, decentralized finance world. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think Miha's doing a great job of answering too. And thanks, Lara, for sharing my blog. It's really old, but I try and keep posts up there whenever I can. So there. Are did we hit everybody's questions? As Ari mentioned, uh, feel free to email her your questions separately. Um, perhaps after you had a chance to read some of the materials that she suggested, 
that will drive additional questions of helping us all understand because it sounds like it's going to be an important thing for us to understand going forward. So I will guess I'll be one of those people reading those documents, Ari, seeing what I can do to get uh, more comfortable with it as a working knowledge uh, on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis. Um, yeah, there's a book, The Bitcoin Standards. I would read that. Um, Gradually Then Selling by Parker Lewis. Essays are really good. If you want to buy Bitcoin, I really recommend um, Swan, but you can buy it through these three other ways. Actually, I think Venmo just announced that you can do it through Venmo too, but um, I haven't figured out how to do that. And then um, let me also share. If you wanna get involved with the uh, blockchain council, here's a link to that to learn more. And um, oh, we also have a Slack channel. So I'll, introduce, I'll uh, give you a link to that. Um, there's a whole community of people, crypto enthusiasts, people that are building in the blockchain and crypto space. Um, so we have about 400 members right now. So you can always come into the, uh, the Slack channel and ask questions, or you can also direct message me there if you're into Slack. Um, that's also another way to get in. Um, I also run a bunch of meetups. And so I have a Ask Me Anything event every Friday at 12 o'clock. If you'd like to attend any of those and just ask random questions and you just want to talk it out, um, that's also um, a resource to you. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're just trying to create as many resources because there's a lot of information. There's a lot of misinformation in the space. Um, there's a lot of FOMO, like feeling like, oh man, I really want to get 6,000% <laughs> on an investment. That sounds amazing. Um, and so you feel like this rush and panic to uh, take advantage of that. And um, I'd say like, just, you know, hold the table and uh, make sure you understand the fundamentals as much as possible. I mean, one of the best ways to really start caring about the space is to put a little bit of money. So, you know, maybe that's $10 or $5 or $100, you know, buy a little bit and, you know, try it out and you can really see just how simple it is. You know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of the user experience and the interfaces, but um, you, you can do it. You can figure it out. If you need help, uh, definitely feel free to email or ping me. Um, there's lots of tutorials on the internet um, that you can use just be really careful and uh, yeah, try it and you'll, you'll see. Well, thank you again, Ari, for your time and sharing all this information and the resources. I have no doubt you'll be hearing from a few people on this call with additional questions going forward. And um, uh, I know that there's a couple of entrepreneurs that will be very interested in, in uh, reaching out to you as well for some support and mentoring in their startup. So. Again, thank you very much for your time. Thanks all of you for participating and, and, uh, and being part of our uh, technology series talks this afternoon. If you would like to uh, keep up with what else we're doing, go to nwirc.com and we'll have the next uh, talk topics and where you can uh, sign up for those listed on there. Uh, and then other than that, Thank you and have a really great evening to all of you. Thank you again, Ari. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye.